Good morning, friends. Good to see you today. How many of you have been out this morning and you've blown the snow and you've shoveled and you've done all that thing? Good thing. Yeah, yeah, me too. I feel your pain. I'm really glad you're here today. It's just great to see you. So I say good morning to you, sort of, kind of, by faith. Good morning to you. And Don Kahn, you did a wonderful job. You got all these people to sit right here in the center section. And uh, uh, that's not a job I'd want to do, but uh, Don is a former Marine, so he can handle that. In my first church, we had a sanctuary that seated about 350 people or so. And in our first Sunday there, we had 36 people, 36, 38. And uh, so I decided to rope off the outside sections. And the Sunday after I did that, folks came in and took the ropes down and sat wherever they wanted to. <laughs> so ever since then, I really don't care where people sit. I'm just glad we got people sit wherever you want. I'm glad to see you today. Great to have you. I like to preach to big crowds, and I, I know you're out there. Uh, I just can't see you, but I'm so thankful for those who are here this morning. And uh, as the weathermen always say, bundle up and drive carefully and, and all that kind of stuff. Despite the weather, despite the, the hit we took in our attendance, I'm excited today. I'm excited because I get to preach. I'm excited because I get to preach from this. And I get to preach to you, and I get to preach to you, and I get to preach about Him. It's always about Him. So I'm excited today. Would you join me as we turn in our Bibles to the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to that church in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26. And Jesse, I'm very excited for you. I'm very excited for Honduras what God is going to do when the two of you get together and our prayers are with you. Please stay in touch with us. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26. And didn't Pastor Weaver look wonderful in that uh, video? He just looks great from a distance like that. He just <laughs> looks wonderful. I'm going to lower this thing a little bit because it's set at a Weaver height. There we go. I don't want to exert myself too much. Ephesians chapter 4, please, verse 26. If you go back to verse 25, you see that Paul is, uh, well, he's concerned about how we talk, how we communicate with each other, something that we do almost mindlessly, routinely, and a lot of times we don't put a guide or a guard to what we say. And uh, he admonishes us in verse 25, to speak truthfully. And in verse 26, he says, in your anger, do not sin. Now, anger in and of itself is not necessarily a sin. It's what we do with it, what we allow it to do to us. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. So themes of honesty and productivity or usefulness, not only with our hands, but with our words are coming into focus here. In verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk, once again, that emphasis. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful in building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, 
brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Mm. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I want to build this message around the Apostle Paul's admonition in chapter 5 and verse 2 to live a life of love. And if someone asks you, what did the pastor preach about today? You don't have to stand there with a blank look on your face, trying to grasp what he talked about because he told you, living a life of love. It's my privilege and joy and challenge to speak to you today about living a life of love in of, in of all places, the hardest of all places, the home. Now, we all know what home should be. It should be a haven. It should be a retreat from all the evil and ugliness of the world, and there's a lot of that out there. Home should be a place where the most trusted and trustworthy relationships are found. Home should be a place where it's always safe, in every way safe. I'm going to share three words, three principles from our text that can guide us in living a life of love anywhere, but particularly, especially in our homes. And the first guiding principle is seen in the word limitation. And there are two areas. Paul identifies where we must have healthy limits, where we must draw boundaries so that our homes will be safe and loving. The first limitation is seen in guidelines for our words. Guidelines for our words. You remember the old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, that's not true. Words do hurt. In fact, more hurt has been caused by words than any other means. Words hurt, words cut, words wound, words linger, sometimes for a lifetime. We need a home life where responsibility is taken for the words we speak. There should be a pact, a, a prayerful commitment to speak no evil, to do no harm, to use no words that humiliate or denigrate ever. No matter how angry we get or how justified we think wounding words may be. Paul said in verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. And he gives us guiding principles and productive speech. He says, but only what is helpful, what builds others up, what is according to their needs, and what benefits those who listen. And please make the connection between, because Paul makes it, between something as, as routine as what comes out of our mouths in verse 29 and the potential of grieving the Holy Spirit in the very next word, verse. There are spiritual ramifications, repercussions to the words we speak. Our words can lift up or tear down. Our words can heal or hurt or help or hinder. Our words can bring life or death. No wonder Proverbs says, the tongue has the power of life and death. The tongue that brings healing is a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. No wonder David said, Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. What kind of words are spoken in your home? Are they thoughtful or thoughtless? Do they build others up or tear them down? Do they help 
or hurt? Do they unite or divide? Do they bless or wound? Guidelines for our words. And then we have deadlines for our anger in verse 26. Paul said, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Three times at least he references our anger. An angry heart, an angry face, angry words, an angry home is a sad legacy to leave one another or to leave our children. I know because I grew up with two very angry parents. Angry at each other, angry at everyone. Angry at life. At times we kids felt they were angry at us just for being there. Anger is one of the most dangerous and deadly attitudes we can carry through life. Did you hear that? It is toxic. God knows that, and by His Spirit, He inspired the Apostle Paul to tell us to handle anger with care, to draw deadlines on our anger. In verse 26, he says, In your anger, do not sin. Control your anger. Don't let it get out of hand. Don't let it take you where you shouldn't go. Don't let it take you where you will regret it. You control it, or it will control you. In verse 31, he echoes this theme. He says, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and malice, every form of it. So we control our anger in its degree, and we control it in its duration. In verse 26, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And some of you, as you read that, you're, you've already begun to calculate when the sun goes down. And believe me, Paul is not really interested in that. He's not, he's not saying the long hours of summer give you additional time to hold on to your anger. He's not saying if the sun sets at 9.07, you can hold on to your anger to 906. No, he's telling us, understand the vicious nature of anger. Understand that anger is too dangerous to keep around very long. Anger is caustic and combustible. Anger is toxic. Anger is a tool that the enemy uses to divide and destroy. Now, we took note that our words have a spiritual component, and so does our wrath. It's easy to miss, so don't, let's don't miss it. In the immediate context of this discussion of anger, and your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Paul says, and do not give the devil a foothold. The devil welcomes our anger because through it, he gets his foot in the door. And once that rascal's got his foot in the door, it's so much easier for him to enter into our hearts and our homes. He delights in our anger. He's drawn to our anger. Our anger opens the door to him and says, come right on in. Here, let me open the door for you. Nobody wants to be around angry people. Not your spouse, not your children, not your friends. Nobody ever says, let's invite so-and-so over. He's always so delightfully angry. <laughs> his loud voice and his contorted face are so charming, aren't they? And I love it when his nostrils flare and his ears turn red and his lips get so drawn and tight and you can, you can see the steam coming out of his ears. No, I don't think so. Anger alienates. Put limits on it. Limitation. The second principle seen in these words, not only limitation, but demonstration. Now we have two areas of limitation, words and wrath. We have two areas of demonstration. And the first one is kindness. 
I love that word. Verse 32, be kind. Be kind. And compassionate to one another. I came in this morning, Pastor Jeff showed me kindness and compassion. He said, Pastor Hawkins, I'm sorry that the weather is going to reduce the crowd today. How thoughtful. It takes a preacher to have that kind of empathy for another preacher, I guess. But I'm not holding Pastor Jeff personally responsible for the snow. Jeannie, maybe, <laughs> but not Pastor Jeff. Kindness, think about it, dear friend. Kindness goes a long way and stays a long time with someone. And the world is hungry for kindness. Many years ago, I was in a department store looking for a tie. Yeah, my philosophy is you can't have too many. There's always one out there that's prettier than the one that you have, the ones you have at home. I, I'm in counseling for this. Pastor Brett sees me on Tuesdays. <laughs> so uh, I, I found a tie, and uh, I took it to the counter. And the lady behind the counter was crying. And I said, are you okay? She said, yeah, I'm okay. She said the customer that just left was so rude. And I said, well, I'm here to make up for him. There's so much rudeness in the world. Maybe we can make up for some of it. It doesn't really take that much effort. It really doesn't. And a little kindness and a little consideration and a little politeness can go a long way in making someone else's life a little better. I have a neighbor uh, who's nice gentleman, but, but has been maybe a, a, a little standoffish, not unfriendly, but not warm and fuzzy. And a few weeks ago, we had our first of many significant snowfalls. And uh, I heard a snowblower outside, and I looked out the door, and he was clearing my driveway. And he saw me and he waved and he grinned and he never looked happier. In fact, I don't know if I have ever looked happier. <laughs> and then we got our second significant snowfall and so Carolyn joined me and we we're ready for the work ahead of us. We put on our gloves, I put on two pair of socks, I put on my boots, I put on my hat and my hoodie and my coat, and I opened the garage door, and lo and behold, someone had cleared the driveway and the sidewalk and the porch. So I'm thinking, my neighbor has either made a New Year's resolution to help the elderly, <laughs> or he's got a new snowblower, and he's just loving it. And I'm loving it too. And I can't wait till he gets a new lawnmower. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, he didn't show up at the third significant snowfall we got. And I, I wanted to call him and say, well, are you coming or not? <laughs> but last Sunday, remember last Sunday? It was somewhat like this Sunday. It snowed. We got several inches. And when we got home, the driveway was done, the sidewalks were done, the porch was done, and I took a nap. Well, I, I let him sleep in this morning. I beat him to it. I hope he'll notice that I could use a touch-up this afternoon, though. That'd be all right. But I'll tell you the truth I'll always remember is that this is a guy who showed me some unsolicited, unexpected kindness. He went out of his way to make my life a little easier. And if he ever needs me, count on me. I want to be there for him any way I can. You know, of all the places kindness starts, it needs to start where we, where we live. It needs to start in the home. 
in the way husbands treat wives and in the way wives treat husbands, in the way neighbor treats neighbor. Model kindness. If you can teach your children kindness, you would have given the world very special people. Kindness. A second virtue to be demonstrated is in verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving. Forgiveness. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You know, we talk a lot about forgiveness, but probably not enough. Forgiveness is such a huge part of the believer's life. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. How did God forgive us? Well, he did it immediately. He did it completely. And he really did it unconditionally. I've always believed that good Christians have to be good receivers and good forgivers. Uh, I've often been asked uh, the question, what's the secret to staying married for 50 years? I don't think there are any secrets. First of all, marry somebody like Carolyn. That ought to give me a good week ahead. (laughs) Secondly, of course, commitment is the foundation of a good marriage. Amen? Don't forget that word. We stumble all over it, but it's so important. Commitment. Remember, for better or worse, in sickness and in health, When the satellite dish goes out, part of the vows, right? But forgiveness. Forgiveness has to be at the very top of the list, too. I'll never forget years ago. In fact, it's decades ago. I was walking through a Christian bookstore, and I saw a book, and the title was Opposites Attract. And the title was crossed out and replaced with the words Opposites Attract attack and there's a lot of truth there you've got to be good at forgiving forgive 70 times 7 and then start over sometimes it's hard in our carnality in our humanity in our pride to forgive and we want to hold on to our hurts we even want to harbor our anger sometimes We want to punish that other person by not forgiving them when we're the ones being punished and we have punished ourselves. If you can't forgive, you don't understand what a great sinner you've been, my friend. How much you have needed forgiveness and how much forgiveness God has provided you and me. If you can't forgive, you don't understand sin or His grace. Think on that for a little bit. It might loosen something up on the inside that will allow you to forgive like a healing, cleansing river. Limitation, demonstration. The third word in living a life of love is the word imitation. You see, what makes all this possible has nothing to do with what is available in us. It's not our resolve. It's not our good efforts and good hearts and good intentions. It doesn't flow from that at all. No, it's, it's what God has already done. You see, we don't work for victory. We work from victory. It's not a matter of our initiative, but our imitation of what He has done for us and in us. For example, we love because He loved us. We live a life of love because we are dearly loved children. Right here, chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 2. A few weeks ago, I preached, I preached on heaven. There are going to be a lot of surprises in heaven. Oh, my goodness, the surprises. I can't wait to hear an angel sing. The music, the singing, the colors, the brilliance of the glory in heaven the fulfilling work 
God's going to give us and allow us to do in heaven. Some of the people who are there might be a surprise. Our presence might be a surprise to some others. But I think the greatest surprise, the thing that we, that we all underestimated, is how deeply and dearly God loves us. In chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, we are dearly loved children. And in verse 2, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Imitate this love. Pass it on. Freely you have received. Freely give. And then we love because he loved us, but we forgive because he has forgiven us. Verse 32, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So we love him because he first loved us. We forgive because he has forgiven us. His love enables and empowers our love. His forgiveness enables and empowers our potential to forgive. We didn't create this. We received it, and now we pass it on. Imitation. Paul says, be imitators of God. Don't be imitators of the world. In chapter 5 and verse 7, he said, don't partner with them. Don't be in league with them. Don't imitate them, because the world doesn't know a thing about love and the world's a lot more interested in lust and passion and revenge and payback and one-upmanship than they are with love and forgiveness i have a suspicion that when and if the world catches us imitating our heavenly father it may just show them what they're missing it may create a hunger in them to know him and to be a part of his kingdom where love and forgiveness and kindness prevail. And who knows? It may even work in our homes. The closest thing to heaven on earth should be the Christian's home. To be imitators of God. Good luck with that without God. To be imitators of God requires the work of God's Holy Spirit in our hearts. No work, no effort, no good resolve of man, no good intentions can pull it off. No. It's beyond us. And that's why in the very core of this text that I've read today, we have the Holy Spirit, we have Christ, and we have God mentioned so very often. You see, he knows without him we can sure mess things up. Without him, our words and our anger can do great damage. Without him, kindness and forgiveness can be hard to come by. But with him, we can live a life of love. You can't live a Christian life without Christ. You can't have a Christian marriage without Christ. You can't have a Christian home without Christ. Limitation, remember it. Demonstration, imitation. Pray with me. Father, we thank you today. for your word, your timeless word, your word that is always relevant, endlessly practical, your word that has the combination of the spiritual and the practical beyond what any man by himself could have produced. I thank you today for spirit-given 
words of admonition and challenge and information and inspiration. It reminds us, Lord, that you care. You care about our family. You care about our marriage. You care about us and the manner in which we conduct ourselves in this world. It reminds us today, not only do you care, but you've done something about it. You've intervened. You've provided. You've revealed yourself. You've sent us mere mortals help from heaven. And so I thank you today for the convergence of Father, Son, and Spirit, for the coupling of the Godhead and the Word of God to enrich our lives, to take us where we could never be and go on our own. And so, Lord, now it becomes, it becomes a matter of surrender. We surrender our hearts, our minds, our lips, our words to you. We surrender our marriages to you. We surrender our parenting to you today. We bring it all under you, submit it to you, and ask you to, to please help us. Thank you today. Thank you today that when we call, you answer. When we knock, the doors open, and when we seek, we find that our search is never futile. We never come back empty-handed or empty-hearted because there's a loving God and He's not far removed from any one of us. He walks with us. He's closer than the breath we take, the beating of the heart. He's more intimate than any other relationship in life. So, Lord, may we leave this, pl this place today not downcast, but hope-filled. And may we leave this day, this place today, with a regenerating touch from your Spirit. To go out there where it's tough and to live for you in a way that will honor you, that will speak well of our faith that will demonstrate kindness and forgiveness. There will be a life of love. Would you stand with me, dear friends? Again, thank you so much for being here today. I'm so grateful for you, and I'm so grateful for the story you have to tell about God's workings in your life. Just think of it. From so many different backgrounds and walks of life, he's brought us into his kingdom. He put us into a family. And in that family, we learn. In that family, we are challenged. In that family, we hear truth. In that family, we display and demonstrate love for one another, encouragement for one another, because God knows we need it. And if you're here today and if your family needs a special touch from him would you just reach out to him right now and say lord dad would you do that as the head of this uh, as the head of this family lord i'm coming to you mom would you do that young person would you do that and say lord i know I, I, i'm an individual who needs your work in my heart today lord we uh we want to be good receivers because there's just nothing in us that we can muster up to get the job done, to live for you, to heed the admonitions that we've heard today. As noble as we know they are, we need more than an intellectual awareness of how truthful they are. Lord, we need, we need the work of your Spirit within us. Help us in those very practical matters. Help me, Lord, to be a better husband, to be a better father, a grandfather, a neighbor. Without anything manufactured or artificial, 
May there be a genuineness to the love that you've placed in our hearts. And may it start in our homes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. If you need prayer, if your family needs prayer, we'll be here. We'll be available, and we'd love to pray with you. May God bless you today. Bundle up. Be careful out there. God bless.